Thank you again for giving me the privilege of your company on the Sutherland Report. And I have to say this, please click, like, subscribe and join the channel. In my series that I'm doing politically and at the moment in interviewing prospective parliamentary candidates for reform, I then have a special guest. What is always brilliant is that when we being a lot older, actually talk to young people and we engage in with young people and we find out why they are engaging in the political process at, some, at such a young age and to hear their opinions on why they think the way they do, what has moulded them at such a young age and how they view things in the future. So I am delighted to bring on Jamie Rippingale and I'm looking forward to the conversation with Jamie. Jamie, Hello. sir, I'll punch us in. Nice of you to join me today on the Sutherland Report. It's lovely to meet you by the digital yeah. media. I hope you are very well, sir. Yeah, very well, thank you. Um, lovely weather, as you can see, and I really appreciate you having me on. No, not, a, not at all, Jamie. Jamie, as I've been interviewing candidates, it's been very easy to describe them because they are then prospective parliamentary candidates of reform in regard to various constituencies they are standing for. So how how do you describe yourself? And I would rather let you do that because you will get it right instead of me getting it wrong. Well, I, my name's Jamie Rippingell. I'm a, uh, a young political activist for Reform UK. I just got involved volunteering and helping. Um, I've since gained, you know, trust and relationships with a couple of PPCs, uh, Matt Wood being one of them, one of your interviews, and um, a chap called Richard Oakley, who's the candidate for Hindburn, the PPC for Hindburn, and his sort of advisor. Brilliant. So, Jamie, coming into this, how old are you? I'm 17. Wow. So you left school a year ago? Uh, about that, yeah, about a year and eight months ago, yes. So you completed your GCSEs, off you yeah. go. Could you just explain what you're doing now? Yeah, super. So as soon as I left school, or even before that, I had um, lined up an apprenticeship, which is also something reform are, are keen on doing um, in supporting apprenticeships. And, well, that, that's another thing, but move aside. Um, yeah, I, I got an apprenticeship with a, with a company um, and moved on, and there was a gap open in IT. And um, I've been there since uh, for about a year and eight months. It'd be two years in August. Um, yeah, um, been working in IT. Brilliant. When you, Jamie, when you left school, and there is a point to this, when you left school, um, did you know what you wanted to do? Have you always been interested in IT? Uh, no. <laughs> Straight answer is no. Uh, interested in IT? No. In, uh, know what I was going to do? Not really. It was only towards about March, so in year 11, so just before the end of high school, um, where I got a, um, a uh, mock interview with a company. Um, and then I basically pursued them and asked them, you know, could I could I get an apprenticeship or could I inquire? And it basically went from there. But I, I definitely, definitely think uh, not just me, but many young people don't know what they want to do as soon as they leave school. When you say a mock interview, um what do, what do you mean by that? Were they? Uh, did you do work experience with this particular company beforehand? No, so it was a way of our school preparing us for interviews. Um, right. But uh, me being the cheeky chappy I am, just asked, you know, have you got any apprenticeships going? Um, and it's not something which is really taught about in schools, apprenticeships. And it's something I certainly haven't um, seen or heard about much until obviously recently with uh, the whole development of it all, especially since reform adapted that policy. Right. And first of all, congratulations on how motivated you are and for being extremely savvy from your interview to turning around and going, have you got any jobs? Have you got, well, have you got an apprenticeship? Um, so all, all credit, all credit to you. And how long is the apprenticeship with, don't name the company, but with this particular company? Oh, well, it, it's um, two years, uh, but I sort of, because I've moved into IT now, I've sort of um gone out of the apprenticeship as it was um i'm sort of just in it now so that, that's what i do yes 
So um, are there other, do they have a track record of taking on other young people? Yeah. So my, my predecessor in IT had come through an apprenticeship um, and um, left. Um, and then basically I came in, filled in his shoes. Brilliant. So they have a history. They've got a bit of a record of, of, yes. of doing that. Yes. And then they then have a relationship. There is a reason I'm saying this. They then have a relationship with the school that you used to be uh, part of. Yes, yeah, sort of. And um, it's, it's nice because I, I go back there to represent the company uh, at the school where I went. And, you know, and I mentioned my story and other young people who are, they want to be TikTok stars or football players. Mm. And I say to them, we want the white winner so that you, you need to have a, an option, you know, and mm. so sort mm. of think about apprenticeships is huge. Mm. So when when you go back to the school, what what are you you're doing that? Is it under the guise of, again, giving uh, giving interview practice uh, or is it under work experience? No, no. So we had had for work experience trapping recently who went to the same school. But uh, no, it's it's mostly just about representing as a company. Because people will look at a company, you know, not to give a full example and go, oh, they just do this. But we're just there to show, you know, we've got IT, we've got sales, we've got marketing, we've got all these departments. And it's mainly about educating young people, too. Because, to be honest, when I saw the company which hired me, I thought, I don't know what they do. I walk past them every day, but I've got no idea what they do. And mm. it, it's basically, if they would have said that to me as a young girl, I'd have gone, yeah, fantastic. Brilliant. Sign me up. So it's, Brilliant. you know. Without naming the company, just being a bit uh, without revealing too many details, how many uh, how many people do does the company employ? Oh, uh, about upwards of three hundred. Excellent. And what yeah. when you say IT, what kind of um, contract contracts do they have? What are what are they offering IT support? Oh no, so back up. So no, so we I'm I'm in the IT department. No, right. Uh, we're a, we're a manufacturing business. Um, oh, right. Sort of. Uh, yeah, um, we make we make stuff basically, which goes all over the world. One of the largest producers of what we do in the country, um, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's it, it's it's basically a huge supporter in this area. Um, and funnily enough, uh, Richard Oakley, who's my Pineburn PPC, uh, mm. the, the the where I work has just been added to the boundary just been added because it's normally part of a neighboring constituency mm -hmm. so you you've joined reform up in regard to apprenticeships and i would like to hear it from you at such a wonderful young age you. of and here's full disclosure i did an apprenticeship myself what why are you so passionate about apprenticeships why do you think they are so, so important in what they can offer to our young people and to our country. Well, the, the first thing is very simple, monetary value. You know, it's fantastic because I can contribute to rent, especially when I was younger. You know, um, I can finance things, which I never thought, you know, go out with mates, stuff like that. That's the first thing I would press. Second thing is it's not a waste of time. So certain college courses, you know, uh, not to name names, but drama and things like that. If you haven't got the knack for it, it's two years down the down the drain wasted. Um, and I know people with experience such as that. And they're, they're coming out of sixth form now, regretting it. Um, so there's that. Um, and there's, there's the aspect as well that it's, it's an entry level, but it's fantastic because you get your foot in the door. And if you go to college for two years, who are you going to employ as a company? You're going to pick someone who's been working for, for two years, do, doing college as well, or someone who's been in a classroom, doesn't know anything about work whatsoever too. It's me, I'm passionate about it because it's about the future prospects of people. So your other friends, colleagues, peers, um, are they are they in the upper six at school? Are they some of those yes. in the upper six at school? So yeah, different colleges and things like that, people who I, I know and, you know, it's sort of like a, not a waste of time, but in a way it is because they're, they're back to square one. You know, they're, they're working to apply at jobs at Tesco, entry level jobs like McDonald's. And not, not to say, you know, they pay a fair good wage, but is it, you know, is it long term? They go through staff like that, you know, it's mm. um, so. So, but, yeah. but are, are they planning when they, sorry, are they planning when they finish their studies to then uh, go to university? So, some do, yes, uh, especially the sixth form. And they pressure, not pressure, but it's sort of there, you know, go to university. 
you know, or uh, get further education. And for someone like me who isn't from a privileged background or, you know, even an average background, a struggling background, it is, it's, you know, it's, it's patronising in a way. To be told to do something when, A, you want to work, you want to do, you want to support your family. Mm. Uh, it's quite annoying to, to say there's not many options, especially because, you know, I left school at a young age. You have to wait for certain jobs, but I, I was lucky to get taken on. Well, again, and it's it's. Uh, I do apologise because I know you've got quite a bit of sunlight at times. We've tried to sort that out, yes. but I think, but the uh, the mood effect is uh, is working wonderfully. But we're just trying. We're we're bear with this. But no, I I com I uh, I totally uh, commend you. So, what Thank do you, you think is going through the minds of of other? young people do they just feel as you said you talk about the lack of opportunities or do you think suddenly at the age of 25 mm -hmm. it has suddenly dawn on them and then they want to go and study something completely different what are your thoughts i think i think it's a lack of education which is ironic because they force you into education but in terms of awareness of the options you truly have in terms of you know the options that of apprenticeships uh, the options of different possibilities you could go down to, you know, uh, you, you, you want to do something, you do it. You know, that's what I would tell any person. Uh, follow, follow your gut is essentially what I would say. Because How many of, how many of, sorry, how many of your ex-teachers um, actually had uh, work experience in other other uh, other sort of schools of life um, exactly. before they became teachers? How many? <laughs> You, you can't name it, can you? I mean, if you, if you think if you think about it, it, it is, there's not really many at all with former colleagues, you know, work experience until I left. As soon as I left, basically, all of a sudden, loads of stuff happened. Maybe they didn't like me. But uh, and we've had rats in from the school I went to who are doing work experience and stuff. But, you know, it's as I say, you say mention teachers about what they did and that they're, it's a di different era, isn't it? You know, gone, gone are the days where you could just go into a job from school without having to have a degree in that. Mm. But you're, are you, would you then confirm that your teachers, all they've done is teaching? They have never actually done a job um, outside that? I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, no, well, I... I can't really, I can't really say. In the in the words of Francis Urquhart, I cannot comment. You know, you might think that, but I couldn't possibly comment because mm. it, it, it it's touch and go. You know, uh, it's you know, I'm, I'm there for apprenticeships. I'm there for you know, young activism in politics. But in terms of the actual devil in the detail, mm. um, in teacher wise, it, it's not really information you can obtain either, is it? So. Well, I again, full disclosure, is not about me, but I'm also an ex-secondary teacher who is proud of the fact that I have had industrial experience and yeah. went in and came out. Um, and that's really, think, it's something that I'm very, very, uh, it's very, I'm well, very passionate about. I mean, especially, you know, being in the industrial sector, you'll know then how important it is to tell children, you know, focus on your studies. Because mm. what, what I mean, it might not be the case now, and it probably isn't, but what was the main job people, kids used to go to from the 90s, 80s, you know, the pit mines there. Uh, but, you know, due to successive governments, that's not an option anymore. Because it was those. Well, the other, the other thing, it's about, um, it's this whole thing of uh, aspiration. And mm. I, I've had the privileged to recently uh, interview uh, Robert Kearney, who is the PBC uh, for Reform UK of Borsover. Um, and Robert made an amazing point in the fact that from the 70s, if um, if uh, you look, go to the patent office in the UK and mm. see that there's been a decline of patents that way, since the 70s and i'd never thought about it in that way because yes. of our industrial heritage because as yeah. he is talking about you know creative inventors coming up with solutions for mm. problems and the fact that um this whole sort of lack of aspiration and a mindset so yeah. when i then have the privilege to talk to people like you at and i don't mean this in a patronizing way to say affirm your affirm your youth mm. um this is a real privilege because then you 
you are then uh, to me it's like looking at a motivator for 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 others and as you've yeah. said with the people that you've met through reform and we'll come on to that then people are also encouraged to meet you and say yes excellent we're not and i don't we're not tarring everyone um within the youth with the same br brush to well, say what a bunch of lazy so-and-sos and all they want to do is be on tiktok well exactly and and one thing a point which i'd like to make is you know why aren't it, why aren't is everybody like me or other young people who are doing the exact same thing in the world you know you, you look at the unemployment rates and yes the the government has a way of marking people unemployed and not unemployed you know to, to make the rates low but you look at it and you think it's one of the highest ever you know it's not quite one in ten levels but it's it, it's shockingly bad you know it's absolutely um disgraceful in terms of the uh, the the amounts what have gone there and whose fault is it it's the young person but it's not for the the people who who owned companies you know who which went bankrupt or have um, you know have not done well in business it's not their fault it's, it's the young people's fault but the fact is the options are not there for young people for not you know i can't speak for everybody but certain towns certain cities in the world yes they will have it you look at london you know the opportunities there is relentless they're always looking for interns and things like that and then you look at quiet old towns up here in the north of England. It's not the same. Well, I think we should get into this. You raise, you raise a really, really, really crucial point. Thank you. And I am having this discussion. It's coming up with the candidates that I am interviewing, which is regionally the difference within the regions compared to London. And as I have already raised, it seems that London basically is a completely and utterly different country. Absolutely. Right. Going back to Robert Kearney in that interview I did with Robert, he, uh, he raised a brilliant point. He had seen a study, which we're trying to find, where he said that out of, out of every pound of taxation, 95 pence of that ends up going towards london yeah can i can i just comment um do you remember when rishi sunak made a speech to his constituents saying they took funding from a poor area and gave it to areas like this in his words when he was at a garden party you know um and that albeit that was his constituency but it shows you there is a divide um and it's an unfortunate divide because the class system was abolished under David Cameron. He said, no, 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 no class system anymore. We're, we're, we're all equals. It doesn't feel like that, you know? Well, Mr. Cameron has quite a lot of things to answer for, and one of them is, other than Libya, uh, one of them is the uh, centralisation of power and how you choose members of parliament and where you are parachuting people in. Yeah. Jamie, it's not about me, it's about you, and it's hearing your opinions and, and et cetera. Why, at this incredible young age, going on 55, and that's a compliment, how, how, you know, what has brought you to this point where you are engaging politically on the level that you're doing? And what, what brought you, what has made you at such a young age know what you want to do and have very firm opinions in how you see things planning out in the future? Please. Please explain. Well, I, I think firstly, uh, you know, you talk about class and privilege. And I, I think everyone should be allowed to build their own opportunities. And that's one thing I've done with politics. I've got into it, uh, not as a career. God, no, would not want it as a career. You know, I know everybody says that, but I'm in it to try and make the world a better place or at least the constituency I live in. Um, I got involved mainly because I sent an email to a form asking, you know, could I volunteer? Could I help? Um, and that was just before the Watchdale by-election. Um, and Simon Danchuk had uh, been a very great help to my late mother. Um, you know, he, she, he had done some things for her and my dad spoke very highly of him. And that's why I went. And that's why I got involved with reform. Because, you know, it was A, a bit of gratitude to somebody. Um, and, you know, B, it's a party which I resonate with. It's a party which is, you know, it's, it's the fed up people's party, as I've gimmicked it. You know, we're, we're all ordinary people. You know, I'm 17. I'm a IT person. There's some PPCs who are electricians, you know, farmers, uh, people who work in banks, people who work in libraries who volunteer. You know, just ordinary people. 
not career politicians, not, you know, like the Tory party have this great big ladder or the Labour party where they have a scouting system. It's not about that. It's about hearing their voices. And, you know, Mr. Tice, the reader, has done some fast, fantastic things to do that. And I had the pleasure of meeting him at Blackpool. Um, you know, and it, it, it's just to show that it's a century. Hard work pays off is, one, is another thing about reform, which I can see. And, you know, I have been called certain things and certain words have been said by people because of this option and this path I've gone down. But then I say, you know, what have the other parties done for you? You know, what plans do they have in mind? You know, I mean, when uh, the Tories took over from uh, Tony Blair, they left a note in the Treasury. I mean, Gordon Brown, sorry. Uh, there's nothing here for you. We've spent it. That's going to be the exact same thing with the with Labour coming in. And we have to ask the questions, why? Why, why is our future dependent on people who are, uh, you know, yes, they're democratically elected, but isn't there something better what could be done? You know, uh, why proportional representation is a big factor in that. And that's what I believe in too. Because you see in Germany, they go, it doesn't work. But it does because the people's voice is what matters. And yes, that means swing parties and all of this, but I see that in reform. You know, I, I see an absolute opportunity to make change and make difference. Thank you. So how how do we get other young people to engage? How do we get other young people to be as passionate as you are about it? Of course, well, it's, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say yeah. that we are molded by our life experience to this point, and I'm, I'm not going to dig into that too much. But what I'm saying is, how how do we how do we do that how would you do that well it's i mean i sent an email to the party i sent an email on the website basically saying you know can i help is there, any, is there anything what can be done is there anything i can help uh you know can i hand out leaflets i had no idea about political activism to be totally honest but i wanted to do something because i wanted to get involved with the party and i think other young people as well you know how i said about choices and options i think that needs to be the same for politics we need people to be politically aware, especially at young ages, to influence. And I think that's why, you know, we're former on TikTok. Uh, we're the biggest party on TikTok, apparently. So it's getting young people to notice. Um, and another thing is, a big factor, you know how um, other parties want to lower their voting age, like they did for the referendum. Mm -hmm. If they want to do that, then I think there should be more young people involved in politics for their what they believe in. Because it's the, it's... You know, it's my future, it's my children's future, children's children's, you know, generational future to make a difference. And yet there's still people in Parliament who have been in for generations, uh, not generations, but decades, you know, and it's that same old guard-esque. Which needs... But what is absolutely fascinating is, again, the language that you use, which is a language of, this is a compliment of underst of understanding what a, what has been going on in this country for mm. for de for decades. So, what has formed you? How come you've come to this point where there is this aspirational thinking? There is, as you said, this cheeky chappy. I wouldn't say cheeky chappy. I would actually say someone who's just going to turn around and go, "No, I'm grabbing uh, grabbing things by the horns, and I'm I'm getting on with things. I'm going to make this happen." What has actually formed you? What has created you to to think like this? I think upbringing. Um, you know, not everything's easy in life. Um, I think it was a, a challenge. Don't want to go into too much detail. Don't want a tiny violin playing. But, you know, it's things like that. Uh, witnessing things too. Education is a big thing. I talked about that on the doorstep in Rochdale and Bratpool. Uh, and another thing, which is key, freedom of speech, um, which is, you know, you, you see people. Um, I used to watch uh, Have I Got News For You a lot. And whenever Nigel Farage or, say, Boris Johnson, you know, not a good example, whenever they would be on, they would always be bombarded. But when Sadiq Khan or, you know, Diane Abbott would be on, not bombarded, they'd be, oh, we support you, do a little dig, that's it, you know. And I think as well it's the unfairness and the underdoggedness as well. You know, you think when Brexit happened, uh, 2016, you know, uh, when it, the referendum, I was 10 years old. I was a kid. I, I had no idea. Um, I used to sit at the Terry sometimes because I loved watching the news. I used to see Nigel Farage and I used to listen to him. And I don't think many 10-year-olds would listen to politicians. You know, Michael Fabricant, certainly, because of his hair, I wouldn't. But for Farage and people like that, in that spectrum, you know, Baroness Fox, 
people who can captivate you, people who can make speeches. Um, for example, when I was at party conference this year, um, and I, I got the privilege to see Jan Widdicombe, the fire, the passion, you know, it's something you don't get out of other things in life. Very interesting comment you made. Have I got news for you? Another. Why? Why do you think these people were then saying to Diane Abbott, Sadiq Khan, oh, "Aren't you wonderful?" Uh, without putting words in your mouth? Why? Why do you think that? Um, in the words of Christine Hamilton, and I quote Christine Hamilton: "BBC stands for Booker's Broadcasting Communism," and that's a <laughs> quote. That doesn't mean I believe it, but you, you, you know, and that's Christine Hamilton. But yeah, it's. It's, I suppose it's the way it's worked, it worked out. I mean, you, you look at, um, you remember when John Prescott, um, he punched that person just as Gordon Brown called that uh, lady in Watchdale bigoted. You know, mm. similar timings. Not much of that was talked about. They had a laugh, you know, and I've rewatched episodes of Have I Got News for You because I'm a political nerd. But, and you think the harshness of what they was to Labour is completely different to what they was to the Tories. And to be honest, when I was on my, in the sat in the living room, and I see the blatant wise told me by the Tories, yeah, I'm angry too. But the fact is, there should be some about what, what Weber did, you know, the economy crashing, people losing millions of pounds, you know, families going in debt, going homeless, things like that. Um, they, were, they didn't seem too angry about that. Uh, Would you a, say that there is a left-wing bias then? Um, I, would, I wouldn't say, I would say yes, but to some extent. Because, you, you know, you look at other platforms, you look at how good uh, Al Jazeera is at covering both sides of, uh, of their news, you know. And yes, it's a, a foreign outweigh for media, but I, I think they're fantastic, you know. And that's why I think GB News as well is very important for people to watch because it gives that swing. It gives that other side of view whilst also not being biased, which they have been accused of. But, you know, you could say the same for the BBC. Well, I... I... I uh, I hear what you're saying about Al Jazeera. I would also politely say to you that they are extremely biased, but that's that's my opinion. But but, but I mean but their, I, their coverage. You know, to quote Warby Stewart, he says their international coverage is the best he's ever seen. He would say that. Um, <laughs> understanding uh, who he is, I think uh, um, yeah. the because this is the issue to me. You know where. Where are the true conservatives? I wouldn't class this personal opinion. I wouldn't class someone like Rory Stewart as a uh, as a true conservative by any stretch of the imagination. Well, but I'll, um, I'll, t I'll but, tell you what. I'll, t I'll tell you if you just let me say. I'll tell you something. I was at a VE Day event the other day, um, mentioning I was part of a form and stuff. You mm -hmm. know, just to get out there. Candidate was unavailable, so I went and spoke to a couple of people. Um, Fantastic. And I met a, a wonderful lady called Anne Cheatham, OBE. She's a, a councillor, I believe. She's in her 80s. She's quite senior, but she had just won re-election in, um, uh, in the Edenfield area, which is in our constituency. And I was speaking to her. She doesn't seem like the Tory you see off the Terry. You know, she and I was speaking to Richard Oakley, who had campaigned for her in the, in the 1980s as a Tory. You know, and you think she is literally what you would consider a true blue, blue Tory, uh, someone who, you know, is a conservative, not what these people call themselves conservatives are. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I've been quoted to being called the reddish socialist going in a pint pot Tory by some people, you know. Uh, so I can't fairly comment, but I was blown away by her. Not to say that I would join the conservatives. God, no. And I wouldn't canvass, but she was a really respectful uh, person, you know, and she was... I told her reform, you know, don't smack me in the face sort of thing. And she was like, no, follow your passions. Don't let people get you down. And I don't see other people saying that. And that's another thing I try and advocate to neutrality in politics. Jamie, again, I just I just say this, which is it, it's incredible how how you have been formed, your your views, how that has been formed and the decisions that you made from school. I mean. A lot of young people, especially when they're doing their GCSEs, and, and I'm I'm just saying this, uh, not having taught in mainstream for a number a long time, but mm. it's very tick boxy. It's it's very formulaic. Yeah. If if you, what are the options for then encouraging uh, free thinkers, encouraging young people to think outside outside the box? 
I, I genuinely think one key thing is to attend events, look, look at stuff, uh, Google Claire Fox, you know, the thing she says, the battle of ideas, the freedom and stuff. I mean, I recently got in touch with her and she's been absolutely fantastic. You know, it's, it's things like that. You have to think because I think we are pressed to be Labour at school, mainly because, you know, you're in class, you're talking politics and they're going, Labour are the good guys. You say UKIP, you say Brexit Party, oh, you're a racist. You know, where's the teacher bias? And it's not just that, because, yes, there has been incidents of racism in these parties, but it's about the other levels, too. You know, you look at Labour, their track record of anti-Semitism, the, the oh, Tories, their, their track record of excluding people because of the colour of their skin. You know, um, I've met some fantastic people in the Reform Party who, you know, aren't white British, and uh, yet they're the more patriotic than anyone who I've met, to be honest. Mm. And it, it's and it's things like that. And, you know, I see on Twitter, I see friends of mine who are PPCs who go, you know, who, who are you calling racist? And it just shows a full bench of white conservatives, you know, who have got no interest in the world of colour. You know, it's, it's, it's stuff like that. And it's trying to educate people too. Again, 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 brilliant. But and also, then you're encouraging debate. You're encouraging people to. This yeah. is what we need to sit yeah. down and have and have a conversation. Exactly. Where some of your friends who were maybe still at school, who have, who have maybe left at sixteen and, and college, what are um? How do they view you? How do they view your passion well, for politics? I d I've not asked many people for their opinions. Um, not many people know. Uh, I keep a small fan group, but it's, you know, it's good on you, things like that. I spoke to a friend today and he was like, you know, it's it's brilliant. You're speaking up for what I, you know, you believe in. I mean, it's people with completely different opinions to mine, some Green Party, you know, some Liberal Democrats, uh, who they align with. But it, as I say, it's about promoting neutrality and free thinking debate in politics because... I think every party's got something what you want, but our party's got something you don't want. And I think that's for the same for everybody. And it's the same for you. You've probably got attributes you don't like. I've got attributes I don't like. Mm. It's the exact same in politics. Mm. Jeremy, where do you do you ever see yourself running for? But I know you said no, but do you honestly not? Or do you ever see um, yourself running for political office? If, 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 if I say an answer, I won't be able to get my head through the door, you see. So, you know, it's um, I don't know. It depends on what people think, because I love giving advice. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not the best public speaker at times. I can stutter um, and, and I do like to be in the back shot, but I do like being involved in stuff. And, you know, being on campaign trails is fantastic. And, you know, it's it would be amazing to one day see that hypothetically, you know, touch wood. Uh, but can't really comment because I don't know, you know, where we will be in six months, 12 months, you know, but. Mm. It, it depends if people want me to and it depends if I'm truly happy to because, you know, I, I reiterate I'm in a fantastic job. I, I love my work. So it's a case of balancing it too. No, brilliant. Because the other thing, and you've already covered this, where with reform, you're looking at people that have got, you know, a vast array of life experience that have stepped forward and they've finally stepped forward because nothing is working. It's out of yes. sheer, sheer it's frustration. I must say, it's gone from, you know, three years ago when was reform formed from the Brexit party and things like that, I think it's three years. Um, it's gone from having, you know, your, your UKIP candidates who believe in building a wall around the channel to having candidates who believe in, you know, uh, free, educa uh, free you know, public education spaces to be available for anyone and, you know, sports halls to be built. And, you know, and Mark Butcher with his amazing cinema campaign and, uh, you know, film studio. And you think if... And that's just from ordinary people, you know, people who have experienced the lowest of the low, people, who, you know, who are comfortable. And it's about looking down. It's about experiencing, looking up, thinking, what can we do? And, you know, I've got a million and one ideas if I was to ever be in office or if I was to ever stand or run. Um, and I think it's fantastic. Reform gives that platform because I just want to say, you think about it. If you want to stand for the, to be a conservative, you've got to wait six to 12 years and you've got to be a councillor. If you want to stand for reform, it's not, you know, tomorrow's issues in 12 years. It's today's issues now. You know, this is the time for reform is now. And that's the fantastic thing about reform. Um, and another thing, you 
previous PPCs have probably mentioned is the, the no whip in local politics. The fact is, if a, if a person is elected and they think what they want to do is best for their constituents, they can do it. Even if it's not in the, you know, if it sticks to the manifesto, there's nothing like the Tories where they vote down pothole repairs. You know, you know, publicly vote it down, even though it's a menace to society. It's the exact same thing. And with reform, we can support that. Well, one of the delights I'm having in my conversations with candidates is the fact that trying to encourage, encourage them and go, what, do your, what are your constituents' concerns? What are they talking about? And, uh, and then being able to address that. They understand mm. what's going on and they are learning more and more about what's exactly. going on. They're because prepared, prepared to, uh, to do that. Every day they rub shoulders with the, the people of their constituency, you know, not people who are in Westminster 24-7 or jetting off on holiday because they can't be bothered to quote or claim expenses for three or four houses. You know, the reform candidates who I've met, and most are, bar a few, you know, are just people who, you know, live among us, you know, uh, people who are just there to make a change. You know, as I say, we're the fed up people's party. We, we, we want to make a positive impact in the country and Thankfully, we've got, you know, the support of great people, TV personalities and things like that to, to give us some oomph, to give us some seriousness. Not just to say, you know, we're not like the English Democrats or any of those stupid fringe parties. You know, we're, we're genuine. We, we, we mean difference. Jamie, do you feel, I mean, I know you touched on this, but do you feel that the, there is such a huge distance from yourself, other than geographically, but, but London? It, this whole thing of the levers, the levers of power, we've, we've been just slightly touched well, on that. But I wonder what your thoughts are. You, you probably crucify me for saying this, but, you know, what Andy Burnham has said, you know, like how he wanted the Northern Powerhouse train line and how he's done the B network, which affects our area. And it's fantastic. It's stuff like that. He's building a central hub in Manchester. And yes, he's Labour. Yes, he's the, you know, he's opposite party. But it's things like that which need to be done as a whole. You know, we, I mean, Rishi Sunak held cabinet outside of Westminster for the first time ever. I think it was uh, in his constituency in Yorkshire. So it's little things like that which would be amazing to see. And, you know, I'd love to see departments based up in cities which aren't London. Because, yes, it's nice to have a central hub for state visits and whatnot. But times are changing. You know, not everyone wants the same old, same old anymore. People want difference. And I think that's one thing which definitely reform could do is, you know, think about restructuring because that, that it says it in the title, says it in the top right of the screen, you know, reform UK. That's what we're here to do. We're here to make change. And it, the beautiful thing is, our, you know, our manifesto, our contract with you, it's open for change. So if people have concerns, they can send it in, you know, and, they, and they'll be listened to by the party. They'll be seen by the party. You, know, you won't see Weber seen out with their six point pledge, which was a five point pledge. But they've had to make it six. You know, it's it's things like that as well which give you reassurance. So we so what what you're talking about is do you think do you think there would be more engagement from young people if they see the fact that the opportunities they may look at in London actually start to move away from London and start to reach them in their regions. Well, Do you think that that would really, really help? I think so. And I, and I think it also relies on businesses and, you know, and big industry moving up to places. I mean, do you remember Tesla? They was either, it was either Burnley or England they chose to build their factory. Uh, not Burnley, sorry, Berlin or England. And they chose Berlin um, because they said the attractiveness of somewhere in England just wasn't right. But it's the, you know, it's the, some of the good things which came out of Brexit, you know, because it's been delivered poorly. But so the good thing is that businesses can come in from over the waters and they don't have to worry about certain things which prevented them. And I don't think that's been taken advantage of because if you think about it, um, you know, the more business what comes in, it employs people, it can employ young people. Remember when Ford came over to Essex, you know, you had people, if you uh, ever watch BBC Archive, you had a team man who'd been working there since the 19, uh, 1940s and that was in the 80s. <laughs> It's mm. stories like that mm. which you'd love to see replicated. Mm. 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 No, well, de definitely. I mean, um, this whole thing, uh, which is very, very uh, a subject to my, you know, close to my heart, which is this whole thing of aspiration. And I would say, being a lot older than you, it doesn't matter. It does. The aspirations don't stop. You keep mm. going. 
so it's how we then start to build that from a young age and say right let's just keep going let's keep going um to achieve that I think, you know, it's definitely there. But if you look at some towns, I'm going to give an example now, Scunthorpe, you know, Tartar Steelworks closing their doors for the eco-green policies, which may or may not happen. But, you know, you look at Tartar, you look at Scunthorpe, famous for its steel. Same with Sheffield. Now those industries are gone. And those people who, and the people who worked in the pits had to find alternative work. And you think it's a miracle that this country still functions despite the primary source of income for people just disappeared. And they had to find innovative ways. And that's why IT shot off in this country and things like that. So, you know, maybe a new sector comes out of the blue, which we've never seen, you know, uh, edible tea bags or, or something like that. You, you know, it's <laughs> that's not my idea. I've not patented it. Um, but, you know, maybe an industry. I mean, you've seen with AI, the, the benefits and the cons and the scariness of it. You know, someone who works in IT, I'm not fear of being replaced, but I can do certain jobs which I could should have done physically with AI. And I think it's an industry which could be expanded on, but it needs to be limited and monitored. You know, as you, you probably know in the industry of interviewing and that, you've probably talked about it. And it's one of those things too, which could lead to a multi-billion dollar, trillion pound, you know, economy boost and everything. Or it could lead to a damp squid and unemployment for us all. It's, it's something what's not touched on too much. Well, what's, in, what's interesting is that Jason Moorcroft in, uh, in the, I'm just trying to think, just just uh, north of Liverpool there, and I think in El Ellesmere, when I've interviewed Jason, uh, Jason is has a um, is in AI, is in IT, in AI. So this is uh, this is an imp important uh, important discussion. Um, but but again, meeting people like Jason AI, meeting uh, Matt Wood, experience in aviation uh meet you know having a discussion with uh with uh martin up in cheshire martin yeah. york and his it it background as well um and then today yeah just uh recently just interviewing then uh robert kearney who then runs a business of vintage vintage motorbikes which is fantastic oh, wow. then 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 there's uh richard within uh your area and uh and others eg and it's inspirational but from people from all different backgrounds that have had the courage to step forward um mm -hmm. jamie i want to end end this end this and just say that it's been a delight to talk to you and i hope that we can do this again is there any is there any um i, I just quickly i will say this what being on the campaign trail uh a couple of times just uh in the last minute what what have you learned by being on the campaign trial what are, what have oh. been the number one lesson oh there's, there's a few to be totally honest i mean first of the scale of it you know the logistics secondly you know morale is important among supporters and people um uh, it, it's you know it's it's fantastic because you're meeting people who think the same but you're also seeing people from different parties and it's amazing and of course you get to meet people like Gawain Tower you know the uh, the sort of press guy at reform the conversations I had with him were limitless I'd never forget the information he's given me uh, you know uh, I've gone from you know a couple of months ago standing in Rochdale as the new kid on the block just wanting to help so now sort of being confident with myself being able to tell PPCs and other supporters of reform and people who don't even know who reform is that you know we're here to make change and I hope I can play a part in that. Well, you've been playing a part in what I would call is the ground game. And the ground game, building from the ground up, is is uh, it's profoundly important because we have we've got to get engaged in local councils, get engaged in 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 the local levers of power, and then and then go from there. So, I I highly uh, I highly commend you for that, and thank you for thank that, you. Jamie. I just want to. Thank you for your time. Um, no thank worries. you for joining me in this discussion and also for being such an inspiration at uh, at the age of 17. And I don't mean that in any patronising way whatsoever because it, it 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 is wonderful. And I just ask you to continue and wish you every well, success you. within your IT work job. Keep doing that. If you're going to go into politics later in life, 
go in with all the different life experience and work experience. But thank you for how you are helping a number of the uh, pers prospective parliamentary candidates. And I know I need to talk to you. I'll talk to you about TikTok and various things and we'll uh, to get uh, various interviews out there. So I'm just going to play us out. And then on the other side, um, I will then officially say goodbye. Um, one of the joys of doing this is that I'm pressing buttons all at the same time while I'm talking to you. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us, joining me and the privilege of this conversation with Jamie. Please click like, subscribe, share um, and and engage. So thank you very much indeed. Until the next time. Have a lovely week, month, whatever you're doing.